Hey everybody, welcome to the Sustainability in Motion podcast, brought to you by ED4S. We focus on the fast-moving sustainability world to help the business community better understand sustainability and environmental challenges we face. I'm Matt Orsog, Chief Content Officer at ED4S. Today I'm pleased to say we're talking with Alice Calro, founder of ArcH3, a corporate systemic leadership platform. We'll talk about the state of sustainability, how prepared companies and investors are for the world ahead, ecological overshoot, social undershoot, and other matters. Welcome to the podcast, Alice. Thank you for having me, Matt. All right. First, let's start off. People are probably unfamiliar with that term. What is corporate systemic leadership? Yes, I anticipated that that might be an unfamiliar and abstract term, so I'll briefly elaborate. So most of our listeners are probably familiar with systems thinking, right, with the term. And that has been identified and is often referred to as one of the essential skills and capabilities for navigating a VUCA world, right? And it's also referred to as an essential skill for chief sustainability officers and so on. So then if you think systems thinking and then applying systems thinking in practice, that is what is generally known as systemic action. And then you also may have had that the poly crisis is in fact a leadership crisis, right? Pointing at the vacuum of relevant leadership being provided in addressing the complex challenges that we are facing as a society. So in this absence of former, relevant formal leadership coming from where we would expect it to come from, such as national governments or supranational bodies, we can see what we can see happening is that consent individuals and also entities essentially self-nominate and begin initiating and leading systemic action. And those are who we would call systemic leaders. Right. Or what they do is systemic leadership. And now corporate systemic leadership is then corporations taking on this role of leading systemic change. And it's really a key part of corporate strategy, the fulfillment of fiduciary duty and of corporate sustainability adapted to the realities of a 21st century book world. So hopefully that will do as an introduction. It's a bit funny to have to start with a definition, but we do a lot of novel stuff. So it makes sense, I guess. Thanks. That's a great answer. And that leads right into, you know, tell us a little bit about what RKH3 does. And, and of course, that's part of it. Yeah. So everything we do at RKH3 centers around our, or the so-called RKH3 theory of change, where our starting position is that big business leaders are in a unique position to drive the systemic change and a large scale sustainability transform transformation. And not only that, but in fact, it is a matter of business imperative and of their fiduciary responsibility that they do so, that they take on this systemic leadership role. So that's sort of the theory of change in a, in a, in a nutshell. Yes. And then what we do can be divided into four verticals. One, we help business leaders and sustainability champions grow awareness and foresight through what is de facto a think tank vertical, where we develop our own thought leadership and tools and methodologies for driving this necessary change. Then to the second vertical, we help leaders grow competence and, you know, companies build their capabilities by acting essentially as a training providers, where we provide online training programs and bespoke capacity building on either what we call sustainability as the world needs or on developing the kind of, like I mentioned, the VUCA world ready business strategies and offerings and business models and value chain arrangements and so on and so forth. The third vertical is where we help our clients drive business and value chain transformation. This is through our consultancy arm. And we really like to point out that that consultancy defies the usual distinction between sustainability and strategy slash management consultancies. Like we just treat the two as one and the same discipline. Yes. And finally, we also aim to enable big business leaders to take on driving the systemic change that I spoke about and to really model a new role of business in society by facilitating or us facilitating the building of coalitions and communities of practice. Yes. And in my view, there are two capabilities that strongly set us apart. The first one is what we call systemic foresight, which is really the ability to 
see the big picture of the outer planetary context and how it interacts with human-made systems, especially with the global economy, and then playing the movie till the end and backcasting what needs to happen by when, if you don't like the future we are heading towards. Yes, and another differentiator or success factor that I see as um, key to our work is that we focus on articulating again the business imperative in big business leading immediate transformation and industry-wide and systemic change as opposed to trying to appeal to the moral imperative and we do this we do we articulate this business imperative in the language of business leaders themselves so yeah and so far, it has. It, it seems that this approach has been landing well. It's gathered quite some traction in the little over a year of our case three's existent, existence. So, I'd like to say that we feel confident that we may be well positioned to play out our, with slight exaggeration, to play out our historic role in shaping our shared future in this way and possibly contributing meaningfully to bringing forth a donut economy while we can. Yeah, that's that, that's that's great. So many. Well, I, I can't speak for all consultants, uh, but you see so much consultancy focused on, you know, one project, short term solutions and not really. And I like the way you, you marry, you know, the strategy has to be around sustainability. Sustainability has to be part of the strategy. It's not something over there. That's a separate project. We need the sustainability project. Uh, and in our experience, and we've talked about this with other guests, the companies that do this well, the investors that understand it well, those things are hand in glove, if you will. And 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 you have to think of the long term, the, the whole long term story ahead of you. Scenario analysis is another you know term that people use for that. But that's great. That's great to see. And I, and I hope uh, companies and it sounds like they are, are amenable to that and, and understand the importance of it. Oh, well, yeah, exactly. All right. So I'll go on to our next question. You mentioned the poly crisis in your, in your first answer. Uh, and that's a great segue into our next question. And if people aren't familiar, you know, it's just the poly crisis is climate change isn't the only crisis. The planetary boundaries framework, if people want to look it up, is a great way to kind of frame this. You know, there's nine natural systems that kind of dictate our survival in the world. Uh, and climate is just one of them. And there's a crisis right now. We've, we've reached six of those boundaries. So it's a poly crisis. Uh, there's, there's more, more crises than just one. But that leads us to the topic of ecological overshoot. Tell us a little bit about what is ecological overshoot. And the other side of that is social undershoot and how are they related? Yes. And just to follow up on what you said, one of the aspects of the poly crisis, and, I, and maybe we'll get to that later, yeah, is that it's also the crises in the human-made systems, which are obviously interacting with the planetary systems and the crises in the planetary systems or the air systems are actually inducing and in, in interacting with the crises in the human-made system. So it's really like a full-on full on crisis all over the, the landscape, yes. And so so I'll, from there, I'll go to the, then to speak a little bit about ecological overshoot. So there are different ways to explain the, the term ecological overshoot, starting usually with a very scientific definition. However, I prefer using everyday analogies, which are more easily relatable to people from different backgrounds. Yeah, so one way to understand overshoot is to think about it like a bank account overdraft, which many of us may have some experience with, right? So imagine your bank account was in overdraft month after month, year after year, without you ever paying any money back. All right. So one, there is a very finite limit to how far you can go into that overdraft while still being able to get more money from your bank. All right. And if you hit the limit, you wouldn't be able to buy food or anything else. You wouldn't be able to afford rent if you are renting and you would be kicked out of your apartment and anything you own would eventually be foreclosed. You'd be in a debt crisis, right? And you'd be forced to live in destitution, right? We can all kind of play the movie till the end that way. Like if this is what would happen if we would never be paying back our overdraft and if you would just keep spending, right? So now how much the planet can handle has also a very finite limit. You've already mentioned the nine planetary boundaries, right? So they they are one way to describe what is referred to as the, the planet's carrying capacity, really how much the planet can handle, 
right? And we as humanity began overshooting this earth carrying capacity around 1970, and we never returned to a balanced state since then. So that's over 50 years of accumulating and compounding a planetary debt and damage year after year. In natural systems, overshoot, like this, this situation of overshooting the carrying capacity, invariably always ends in the ecosystem's collapse, following which a new equilibrium, or you could say a new sustainable state, may or will be eventually established like the, it will you know the situation will eventually stabilize again and so by understanding overshoot we can actually predict that again that kind of foreclosure so to speak day is coming yeah so so for a global economy for a lifestyle and that means also that in the future we'll be able to afford much less than what we're used to yeah so that's what i would say is ecological overshoot in in a nutshell and as you already said the term social undershoot was has kind of been coined as a counterpart to ecological overshoot from the perspective of the donut as in donut economics where the outer limit represents the nine planetary boundaries again already mentioned and the inner limit and the 12 so-called social foundations so social undershoot refers to the fact that globally we are under delivering on essential needs and human rights for all. And that this is not a matter of some accidental glitches, but it is a result of systemic causes. And that therefore issues such as cyclical poverty actually cannot be addressed without changing the broader system. Which brings me to how the two are related, right? How is ecological overshoot and social social undershoot related? So they are both byproducts of our current economic system and the beliefs and behavior norms that actually underpin that system, right? So if you think about it, neither our economic system nor our companies have been bold and optimized not to cause environmental harm or to deliver well-being for all, right? They've been designed and optimized to deliver GDP and profit growth and so on, regardless of environmental and social harms, right? So it, it should come as no surprise that, you know, those are the metrics we have been doing so well on. And also, as it happens, um, some of the convenient or easy ways to create and maximize GDP and profits are actually by one, stoking up and catering to non-essential needs for some, while preempting basic needs for others and two also by actually allowing that environmental harm or the, the environmental harms and social harms to keep increasing to a maximum right and so that um, these are the behaviors that our current system has incentivized till now but as the outer planetary context again has, has changed or is really evolving fast, the situation is deteriorating fast, the rules of the game will actually have to change as well. That's a great explanation. And I'm going to steal that analogy of the, the bank account. I've heard the one, I like the one, uh, the bathtub filling up and, you know, you can't put more water in uh, because it'll just overflow. But I think the bank account one, I'm going, I'm, I'm going to use that. I'll, I'll, I'll give you credit for it going forward. Feel free to. We also use another one, and that is one of personal burnout. Because um, I chose not to kind of lead with it today, because I don't know how many people have been through burnout and therefore how relatable it is. I would like to think that more people have experience with account overdraft than with burnout. But uh, you can find in some of our work online that we also like use people's experience with them themselves kind of doing more than how much they can handle while staying healthy, more than we would actually say even is sustainable, right? And really overshooting their own personal carrying capacity and eventually burning out. And the burnout is actually the collapse state. And then you just can't do anything for some time, right? You can't, it takes time for you to recover. And then slowly, slowly you can start functioning again. And, and very likely you'll never function at the same capacity as before right so that's actually another analogy that i find very useful and helpful yeah that is another great one yeah keep them coming <laughs> that's great no these are the two main ones yeah yeah the, the analogy is a great way to be, bring it into people's minds is, oh yeah that makes sense uh so those are those are great uh at the risk of, of breaking the law of uh, of podcasts using visual aids i wanted to to go back just a second to the you know the donut uh, we've it's come up before on the podcast, but I encourage people to look up, you know, Kate Raworth's uh, Donut Economics, and you'll see, you know, on, on Google or, or your browser of choice, you will see 
um, the donut. And in some, in some instances you will see, you know, you want to stay within the donut above the donut outside is, is ecological overshoot. And within the whole of the donut is, is social undershoot. And so as a society, uh, we want to be uh, within, within the donut and outside, you know, outside, either, either in the donut hole or outside or where we want to avoid. And so th- that's just a visual. If you want to pull up People want to pause and pull up a visual. That's 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 a good visual to explain what you just explained very well, uh, just to give people a reference. All right. Well, that leads to the next question of you know we're we're in this overshoot world, and social undershoot world. How prepared are companies and investors uh, for the world ahead? How much do they understand uh, these challenges mm. in your experience? Yeah. So, in short, I think they are not at all prepared. Right. Which um, at the same time, I think many of them are increasingly aware that they are not really well prepared. Right. And one of the leading reasons for this is, in my opinion, our collective lack of systemic foresight. I think I dropped that word before. So that's really, yes, I actually explained it right. It's like playing the movie till the end and so on, right? So so it's that skill and that capability that I spoke about earlier. And the most common symptom of this is that business strategies do not at all consider that outer planetary context, right? They assume that the key sources of disruption in the future are going to come from market sources, right? Sorry, market forces, right? Competition and new technology and regulation and so on. And that may have been true until recently, but will certainly not be true in the 2030s and onwards as the effects of, again, ecological collapse actually play out more fully. And so this outer planetary context is either not considered at all, or if it is considered, it is often done through the kind of climate slash carbon tunnel vision, which is very much like diagnosing one vital organ in a body and ignoring the rest and then thinking that this can help us keep the patient healthy, right? It doesn't make actually any sense. If you zoom out of the big picture, it's a completely illogical approach, right? And uh, it can also manifest as people Again, not zooming out to the big picture, not doing the synthesis, the synthesis part, but just looking at like a patchwork of ESG issues in isolation. And even the most progressive companies actually that wish to take into consideration all the planetary boundaries often struggle to operationalize the framework in any strategic way beyond referencing it. And it is de facto just the backward looking snapshot of the world, right? It's like the, the data will be several years old by the time it's published. So. Both the foresight, the future looking element and the, the systemic big picture element are actually missing from corporate strategies. And this really means that our corporate strategies are doomed to fail. It means that our sustainability agendas are inconsequential for attaining either a livable future on the planet or well-being for all or future business continuity. And so even the most stringent regulatory norms being rolled out, for example, in the EU, actually also because they are not based in that systemic foresight, they are not super relevant for either of these outcomes I just mentioned. And um, to add a little bit more on top of that, so uh, since much about the outer planetary and economic contexts and about where the world is headed is indeed knowable, using what we refer to as systemic foresight, then business leaders, boards and, and, and C-suites and so on, um, who do not look into and do not adapt their strategies in a way that is relevant for a worker world are de facto in breach of fiduciary duty, fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. They are actually squandering future shareholder value, right? So there's a lot of, lot of, it's, it's a heavy topic. And you've asked about investors, right? So investors in the seem equally misinformed or underinformed, or at least I assume so, because otherwise they'd be demanding very different metrics and actions from their investees than they currently do. And they'd be directing their capital and influence very differently than what we can see at the moment. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great answer. And another great analogy about the, the, the body systems. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's possibly the best one. You know, we're just one big system, our bodies. And if something's wrong with your liver, it affects everything. If something's wrong with your heart, it affects everything. And so the heart specialist is just going to focus on the heart and the lung specialist is just going to focus on the lung. But you need to have an understanding of how those things interact and work or you're missing. You're getting the wrong story. You're missing the whole picture. Yeah. The prognosis cannot be right, right? If like it's a big difference in if one vital organ is strained 
and therefore the other ones go into overdrive or if multiple vital organs are strained or even failing as they are now like that's a big that makes a big difference for what is still possible for your patient and what you should recommend and how how radical the remedy needs to be it's, it's just yeah so it is, it's funny that once you think in everyday analogies and once you zoom out to the big picture it all makes common sense it's very relatable right but and it, the more they what we actually do especially like in sort of mainstream corporate sustainability the more shockingly nonsensical it is yeah yeah, yeah. and you mentioned and one thing just popped in mind mind where you're talking about how the understanding of how business works that we all learned in school and our master's degrees and our you know charter financial analyst studies and all those things we need to call into question somewhat you know we need to we need to be more critical of you know the neoclassical economics we learned doesn't really take into account the physical world and the inputs that a ecological economics would and so that's another podcast for another guest for another day but i would encourage people to like you know look up ecological economics for example and see what's different and and we will have you know someone on to talk about that but you know be be critical you know about the the systems uh that you've led to that have led to our current understanding and are they giving you the whole picture and it's the same with business and investors they need to question okay well that's not the world we're walking into you know what what tools do we need and that's and then we've talked about some of that so far and i want to think that's a nice transition to the next question you know you talk about um moving from business as usual uh to business as the world's needs is how you phrase it you know what does business as the world needs look like uh, and then i'll have a follow up to that yeah so the concept of business as the world needs is really an articulation of what business must look like in order to be compatible with a future economy shrunk to within a, within the planetary boundaries uh, to be compatible with a livable future on the planet and with well-being for all right and it is also a response to or building on top of let's say some of the existing progressive concepts such as regenerative business which we find is still not fully cognizant let's say of again the outer planetary context right so a business as the world needs for us needs to meet two criteria right one and they are a little bit multi layered so I'll just again it's a podcast no visual aid so I'll spell out the first and then I say and this is the second yeah so the first the first criterion is that the business needs to be in the business of doing what the world needs right which means catering to essential needs of either humans or non-human stakeholders or delivering overall ecosystem ecosystem health and or solving complex real world problems right and then it has to do this in ways that cause minimum harm and therefore merit receiving a portion of those shared global planetary budgets that we know are going to be actually diminishing going forward right and it also needs to meet this criterion before 2030 which is when we estimate humanity will likely cross the point of no return and may no longer be able to secure future livable conditions for itself on the planet nor future conditions conducive to big business or business by extension right and the second criterion then is that a business as the world needs uh must be actively leading systemic change which we've already mentioned again a few times so this is like a theme that will keep recurring but it needs to be driving the systemic change through interventions carried out either individually or in coalitions with maybe other first moving peers or with you know other you know stakeholder groups and so on and these interventions must have the objective of bringing forth an interim transitional system also by 2030 in order to remove any systemic barriers to that kind of wholesale large scale transformation and also remove um, any key systemic causes of ecological overshoot and social undershoot otherwise we just don't stand any chance right so as you can see this definition departs from one prevalent notions around corporate sustainability such as every little step in the right direction counts and is worth it and each company only needs to do their fair share or also on the more progressive end of the spectrum the notion that being net positive means being sustainable enough or the notion that all we need is regeneration without emphasizing the need for systemic change or without asking and answering 
how much regeneration needs to happen by when in order for it to still matter, right? So I do not say this in order to imply that we are like far better than anyone else. It's more to illustrate how we how we apply systemic foresight in practice and what we recommend or what we prescribe. And perhaps it's also to invite and encourage others to in, explore our work and um, the complementarity of it and potential synergies that may exist and to reach out if you know our approach resonates. Well, that begs the question of, you know, is there anyone doing that? or who's closest to doing that and in, in, in from what you see? Yes. Yes. I get asked this question on every webinar. We <laughs> yes. So, so, um, well, it, it's an obvious, yeah, it's an obvious question. To ask. Yeah. The truth is that no company is currently doing it. Yeah. If you look at the Patagonias and the Ikeas of the world and other companies that are often looked up to as, um, corporate sustainability leaders, they are still at best preoccupied with innovating their business models or offerings and maybe contemplating, contemplating, adopting, or even working towards adopting context-based sustainability metrics, which means contemplating that at some point they'll be doing that fair share, like assuming that every company in the world would do their fair share, then we would be a sustainable society, right? But that I feel like is something something that would have been relevant 20 years ago and it's a bit late for that right and so so none of these businesses have been overtly questioning what they are in the business of and whether and to what degree it is compatible with a future economy again shrunk to within the planetary boundaries or whether it is compatible with livable conditions on the planet right and neither have they been or nor have they been asking Mm, what their necessary role in driving systemic change ought to be. So, in other words, there's lots of work to be done. And at the same time, this doesn't mean that there are no businesses latently kind of warming up or opening up to or even exploring what being sustainable enough or future enough means in practice. Yeah, so thanks to our fairly undiluted positioning, um, we do attract some organic inquiries from corporations in this sense. And we have also a growing number of company sponsored attendees in our training programs. So I would say with both optimism and some confidence that the momentum is actually growing. And that the, I would like to think that the time for radical change is really around the corner. Well, maybe maybe we'll, we'll talk to you again in three years or hopefully sooner than that. Yeah, and, let's hope six months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there will be, not 10 years, but, but there will be, better examples of companies doing farther along to getting to where they need to be. Well, that, well, that these, these questions are brilliantly put together, of course, <laughs> because that leads to the next question of, you know, a lot of the changes we need to have aren't going to come from individual consumers. They're not going to come from companies. They need to come from policy. You know, it's a speed limit or wearing a seatbelt or examples, uh, an example I give is, uh, legislation around smoking, uh, you know, these things that are all done for our health that people complain about at, at the time, but they're, you know, laws and policies that are for the common good. And policy can drive a, a big part of this. And I would argue, and we'll talk about it, that that's not the case so far, you know, but it, so a big part of the transition we need is going to be policy. You know, what policy or regulatory changes need to happen in your mind and where are we in that process? Mm -hmm. So at Arc History, I have to discuss, we have a kind of unpopular, but I would like to say realistic opinion <laughs> on what is possible with policy and regulation. So, so I'll first answer by like, um, indeed, a lot of the policies that need to be in place in order for, you know, business to be, you know, playing a relevant role in the society and for, let's say, degrowth to materialize or for regenerative economics and so on. A lot of them have been already defined actually at quite a lot of depth and breadth, I would say. Although it is also fair to say that predominantly that has been done in the global north without, you know, a lot of inputs or perspectives from the global south taken in. And so I don't want to really be just like listing the whole extensive work of others, but some of the ones that I did, some of the changes that I see as the most pressing ones include definitely a reform of the financial monitoring and banking systems. So that um, especially removing the ability to produce fiat money 
and reducing the scale of the global economy back to the, the to the real economy. Yeah, this is something that, for example, Jim Bendel writes about in, I mean, the difference between the size of the real economy and the inflated size of the just the kind of money economy is something that, for example, Jim, Jim Bendel writes about, right? And then, of course, erasing international debt. And that's, that's again, that's again, um, Jason Hickel and preferably student loans where they they're applicable and that they are as enormous as, for example, it is the case in the US. And another one would be mandatory phasing out of all non-essential industries, right? So I actually mentioned indirectly that a lot of the world economy, at least the real economy, is focusing on stoking up needs that are not really needs, right? They are, they are ones, they are non-essential and then catering to them. And there's no really, like, if we know that the whole, the, our monetary budgets are going to collapse and they're going to be much smaller than what we've been used to, then there's not going to be any place for that. And finally, one of the ones that I see as very important is a reinvention of supranational authorities, their structure, representation, decision-making, and also a role in driving systemic change. So it's not exactly something that a national government can put in place, right? It would have to be concerted action by multiple or most global gov you know, governments around the world agreeing to do those changes. And I think that's actually necessary, right? So there's been a lot of um, um, interest, growing interest, let's say, in bioregional solutions, which I think are great, but ultimately we still need all of this systemic change and all of these, like, addressing the, the root cause of overshoot, we need it to happen in a concerted way around the world. How is it going to happen with, around the world at the same time without global governance, right? And now, coming to the part that I kind of foreboded or foreshadowed that the, the, the unpopular part, right? So, we think that there is a key misconception here stemming out also from sort of insufficient systemic foresight and that is the belief that these policy and regulatory changes could be brought about and put into place in time meaning in the next two to four years or so which is a very ambitious timeline through a democratic or electoral process right and i find this highly implausible like if you actually think through what would have to be the sequence of events and where the cascade of events would have to have started i don't think this is possible at all and uh also, po the policy agenda in many key countries is heavily controlled or hijacked by corporate and capital interests, right? So unless the corporate and capital interests kind of change the tune of what they say they would like to see as policy, we are not going to see a whole lot of new relevant policy introduced, right? At, at the same time, I choose to see this as an opportunity. So what people often don't realize is when I speak about corporate systemic leadership and big business driving interventions, is that big business is actually already very good at intervening in the system. It has, in fact, developed it as a high maturity capability, you could say, right? And, and if you, for example, oh, anyways, not to go into that, but if you just, okay, I've already started the sentence, so I'll just finish it. For those, for those familiar with the uh, 12 leverage points for intervening in the system by Donald Meadows, if you just for the sake of the exercise, go through the 12 and try to think in each of these, how are big businesses or corporations influencing national, you know, influencing the broader system, let's say not just policy agendas, you'll find examples for every single one. Yeah. So coming back to what I was saying is that um, companies are already intervening in the system. They are just doing it at the moment, directing this effort towards cementing the status quo or even, or even kind of deepening that exploitation, right? And they are not realizing yet, this is coming back to the part like enough of the foresight, they are not yet realizing that it is actually no longer in their interest. It is no longer in the interest of personal interest of business leaders. It is not in the interest of shareholders, investors and creditors, and it's actually in nobody's interest, right? So that brings us back to the RKC theory of change, where we say that our best chance of getting any of these policies adopted is if a big enough cohort of big business leaders is actually effectively advocating for them and pushing for them and persuading peers to do the same. Yeah, no problem. Easy. <laughs> well, that leads, in, that leads into our, our last question, uh, and then we'll let you go. You know, so I'm going to ask you to solve this problem. Uh, very easy. You know, how do we transition from the business as usual society we have today to one that's, you know, characterized by lower consumption, a lower energy footprint, you know, and the cultural changes, because this is a big cultural change we're talking about. How does that come about? Mm, yes, it, it relates a lot to what I was just saying. So um, 
Nobody can really predict with any high level degree of accuracy of how exactly this will happen. Yes, because it is the nature of so-called complex adaptive systems, like which the world is one of those, where that there are just way too many players in multi-way interactions and dynamic relationships. And it's just creating so much complexity that it's impossible for us to actually with any any good degree of precision to to predict how things will play out in which order of you know in which sequence of events or so or what will be the key deciding factors there's just no way to do that yeah but what i think we can do is make educated guesses again about how the transition will start or can be started most realistically right and i already alluded to this so to us it seems very impossible that this would happen as a result of either proactive policy change and regulation resulting from democratic pressures and it could also, uh, it kind of seems unlikely that it would happen in time by advocating society-wide tipping points. But, but on the other hand, a cohort of, a big enough cohort of big business leaders is also a tipping point of its own. And none of us probably believe anymore that this transition could somehow be triggered by better sustainability reporting, right? So from where I stand or where we stand at RK3, there are really two key stakeholder groups that have the most power and influence over other stakeholders groups and over outcomes that could be really be the significant enough first movers that would activate other fellow first movers and unleash the kind of snowball effect of systemic change. And those are, again, big business leaders and investors actually, right? And the why I have confidence that it could happen is, again, that it is actually a matter of enlightened self-interest that they take on this role this kind of systemic leadership role immediately right so it is a working hypothesis that the best way to open their minds to doing so is by communicating the business imperative not opening the door with the moral imperative and doing so again in the language of business and helping them develop their own systemic foresight and then act on it and as you or as we spoke about in the introduction at Arcus, we've of course developed a suite of tools and methodologies and exercises for companies who want to either explore taking this on or who are actually already considering taking it on and want to begin modeling that new role of business in society now and so we encourage everyone who wishes for the transition to be started and completed while it still matters to look us up engage with our content and resources and explore mutual synergies and perhaps partnerships and so on and so forth that's a great answer uh and a great way to end things you, I, yeah you have to you have to meet people where they live uh, as the phrase goes, you know, and wagging your finger at someone, you know, whatever the problem is, it shuts people down. It doesn't, it doesn't work. So I invite people to have that conversations with, with you and with myself and others who are doing, you're doing this work. Uh, and we'll see, and maybe we will come back in three years and everything will be solved. We'll talk to you again, but ho hopefully, but, uh, good luck in your, your endeavors. Uh, I hope, uh, a lot of companies do take you up on that offer. Uh, and thank you again, Alice, uh, for joining us today. And thanks our listeners for listening. If you want to engage with any of us, uh, we're on LinkedIn and social media. You can you can track us down. We're happy to talk. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about ED for us, you can check us out at edforus.org. Thank you for having me. Thank you everyone for listening. Pleasure being here. Great conversation. Take care. Take care.